I was walking down my block and now the cops are stopping me. Stopping I said, what me? you doing here? Like, why you trying to talk to me? Why? I said, officer, what am I doing wrong? Let huh? me get just what I came for. I really won't be long. When no, I told well. him I had children, he was looking at me differently. At me doing differently. what I'm doing, why he got to clench his fist at me? I came why? about the dirt, but they still mad because of my history. Top. I'm going to keep on going to the top until they sick of me. They Said he protests, but I don't even see a change. Always hearing BLM, but is it really in is your really brain? Got to see what's huh? going on. Cause we ain't all treated the same. Why so serious? I'm furious because this is not no game. Nah. Welcome back to another edition of NBWA, New Brunswickers Want Action. My name is Dr. Timothy Christie. And I'm Matthew Martin. And we have a very special guest for you today, the Commissioner of Systemic Racism in New Brunswick, Dr. Manju Verma. And before we introduce her, here at NBWA, our action items are the three things very specifically of wanting a public inquiry into systemic racism in New Brunswick. We want education and history to be taught properly in Canada and New Brunswick specifically, and also we're calling for the criminalization of racial discrimination. So Dr. Varma, we'd like to thank you for being here with us today. If you wouldn't mind, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit of your accomplishments? Sure. So uh, I'm Manju Varma. That's, I guess, the first thing to uh, to put on the table. Um, I was appointed as Commissioner on Systemic Racism in October. So it's a new, a new appointment. It is the first one in New Brunswick. And from what I've been told, it's also the first one in Canada. So um, I don't take that lightly. I, I see it as a historic moment in, uh, in our province's history. And, um, and really, my focus is to speak to organizations, to individuals, um, to groups uh, of, um, that have experienced systemic racism or would like to be involved in the dismantling of it. So it is not my role to define what it is, um, and it's not my role to tell people how they've experienced it. It's my role to collect those stories and then present them to the provincial government um, in the form of recommendations. Um, I need to underline that I'm independent, so I'm not a, a uh, employee of the provincial government. So what that means is it allows me the opportunity to be critical of systems that are in place right now, but also to provide uh, recommendations on how we can work together to, to get rid of some of those systems that perpetuate systemic racism. And um, just, you know, in terms of your background, my, my understanding, we both grew up in Moncton. I was born in London, England, but my family moved to Nova Scotia uh, when I was very young. And then actually, as a result of systemic racism, my father lost his teaching job. And so Moncton was this up and coming growing city. And so that's, that's where we moved to. And uh, except for, you know, uh, university time away, I have grown up, lived and continue to raise my children in Moncton. Usually when we have a guest, we try to have a discussion within one of our priorities. So sure. our priorities are the same every episode, but they don't change. Mm -hmm. uh, but we try to dig a little bit deeper into each one. So we were hoping that we can have a little conversation with you about uh, this uh, public inquiry thing. Mm -hmm. So as you will know, and as many people will recall, last year at this time, it was uh, December of 2020, the opposition parties in the Legislative Assembly made a motion to the government that there be a public inquiry yes. uh, into systemic racism in New Brunswick. And it was from different groups and they had different agendas and they were thinking about looking more at justice and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But it was for a public inquiry. And the government said that they're not going to do that. They amended the motion to take the public inquiry aspect out. But they did say, we are going to have a commissioner mm -hmm. on systemic racism, which is That's you. That's correct, yes. Wh which is you. Uh, and then w the, they gave ver a very specific work plan for the commissioner and said that um, consultation is very important mm -hmm. and through consultation, study, investigations that uh, the commissioner is supposed to come up with some recommendations at the end of this uh, for government. And one of the things that we're concerned about is there are, have been many commissions many inquiries, many studies, mm -hmm. many books, many documents written on systemic racism in Canada, in North America. Um, one of the first recommendations out of the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls uh, 
inquiry that happened was to implement recommendations from previous recommendations <laughs> yes. from previous commissions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think that um, there are tons of recommendations out there. There's been tons of consultations happening and we know systemic racism exists. We know that it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us have a pretty good idea of how to approach it, yet the work plan for you has been um, recommendations. The definition of insanity is really doing something <laughs> over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So I guess our question is, you know, as Dr. Christie mentioned, you know, while this may be the first commissioner on systemic racism with New Brunswick and, and possibly mm -hmm. within Canada, um, it's not the first time that racism and systemic racism has been looked at through research, research papers, public inquiries, um, and each one, as Dr. Christie mentioned, has produced recommendations. Um, so we're, we're wondering why um, there's still that interest of continuing with recommendations when historically recommendations are made, presented to governments of all levels, um, and they're never implemented. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our, I guess our question is, you know, why continue with that process when historically they're never implemented and it, it's really just setting up initially for failure? Right. So I, I, I want to say right away, I appreciate your skepticism. And I'll be honest, when I saw the, uh, the ad, um, I knew it was out there. Um, I had not applied and I wasn't going to apply because I had the exact same step skepticism. I was like, this is just another activity, another exercise. We, we've all been consulted to death, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was extremely suspicious and uh, had no intention of applying for the position. Um, it was only because a couple of colleagues reached out to me who represent other organizations and said, like, have you applied? And I said, no, and I explained why. And one of them said to me, well, it's like voting. You know, we vote every four years or, you know, every, but just because your party didn't win doesn't mean you stop voting. Because if you stop voting, then you can't complain anymore. So I was like, okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I did investigate a bit more into what the position was before I threw my hat in the ring. Um, so I, so I did my doctorate in uh, anti-racist education 20 years ago, and it focused on New Brunswick. And at that time, uh, I was at University of Toronto, you know, with the great minds of all these people working in uh, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism. Um, and when I said I wanted to do it in New Brunswick, they said, no, there's no diversity in New Brunswick. Like, why would you want, you can't do your doctoral work there. It won't be credible. So that was 20 years ago. And I had to fight to, to make, say, yes, actually, it is credible. We have a history, right? Our linguistic history speaks to racism. and and we have indigenous population and we have long-standing black population. So yes, we actually do. And the fact that you don't know as people who work in this area says that there is a need. This time, so that's been 20 years. This time, I feel like the door is open wider because rather than getting recommendations and going to the government, the government is saying, you know, we're not opening the door to government. The government has opened the door and saying, we know something's wrong. I think right now there is a real awakening, whether it's because of the murder of George Floyd, whether it's because of Black Lives Matter or the rise of um, you know, anti-Asian hate because of COVID. There's just an awakening right now among the public that was not there 20 years ago. So um, I get what you're saying because one of the things I like about the calls to action actually in the TRC was they said the same thing. They said, rec it's t the time for recommendations is gone. It's now time for action. So maybe that's what my recommendations will be called, although I'd like to coin a new term. <laughs> so if you have any suggestions, <laughs> let me know. Uh, so I agree, the time for recommendations is gone. It is time for action. And, uh, but that action is, um, needs to be a cooperative issue. It needs to come from stakeholders. It needs to come from organizations who perhaps in the past didn't even think about how systemic racism impacts them. And it needs to come from the government. So I'm seeing a level of cooperation that I have not seen before. The other thing is I'm close to the end of my career. You know, uh, I've been working in this area for 30 years. Um, I have far more courage than I did 20, 30 years ago, and uh, I'm quite comfortable in speaking my mind. And so, and, and being independent, I have that, uh, that privilege to do mm -hmm. so. So if 
when I give my recommendations. First of all, they'll be given by me, not by the provincial government. So if at that time I see that there's a resistance to recommendations that could be put into place, I have no problem speaking up about that. So those to me are two very important differences than what I've seen in the past. And, and I think that's, that's fair enough because the environment now, the culture we're in, is a little bit more sensitive mm -hmm. to some of these things. And you're right, the ability uh, to be at your point in your career to be able to speak truth to power is really, really important. Yes, yes it is. Yeah, but, but fundamentally, we, we, we would like to just talk a little bit about this recommendation approach. And there have been some recommendations that are very, very good. Mm -hmm. And our concern is we're not really willing to rely as heavily on the goodwill of government. So governments, as you know, are political beasts. Mm -hmm. They are creatures that have their own agendas. And many of the things that um, are happening, are uh, we're very concerned about political influence and mm -hmm. interference. So with uh, responses to COVID and that type of thing. Right. So if we're going to address systemic racism in New Brunswick and do something, once again, recommendations do not seem, and no matter what we call them, recommendations or calls mm -hmm. to action or whatever, they just seem to be impotent when it comes to identifying the change that we need. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you plan to come up with the recommendations, how you plan to get them, and why you would think that they're going to make a difference in that okay. sense. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm a conflict mediator as well. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I try to focus on is our positions may be different. As you probably know, there are some organizations, um, some groups that have, have publicly stated that they're not going to participate um, in, this, uh, in, my, in my position and in my work um, simply uh, because they did want an inquiry or they wanted something else. And I respect that. Right? We all have different positions. What I want my recommendations to focus on are our shared interests. So the government may say, and you know, I, we use the term government loosely, right? Mm. And, and it's not just governments that are political. It's also groups that are political, right? We all have our mandates and, and what we would like to see happen. And, and I've learned there's just as much politics <laughs> in that as there are in the big P politics. Um, so my, my plan is to sit down and focus on what are the shared interests that we have. So for example, a sh an interest of the government is to see our population grow, mm -hmm. right? Well, they've made that very clear. But if we don't have the systems in place that don't welcome people, and not just immigrants, but people uh, from other provinces, you know, people that are already here, if they don't feel welcomed because of systemic racism, they're going to leave. So one of the things that I've noticed uh, to back that up is um, I've spoken to about 22, 23 individuals already in the past couple of months, and I've noticed a very strong theme, and that being that among the immigrant children that I've spoken to, their parents say, like every single interview this has come up, work hard, work twice as hard as everyone else, keep your head down, and get out of New Brunswick as fast as you can. Right? From a government point of view, that's really bad news because you've got a group of educated people who could be our future and all they're focused on is taking that talent elsewhere. I've heard the same message from um, the few indigenous youth and, uh, and black youth that I've interviewed so far in that same thing, you have to work twice as hard to be recognized, keep your head down so that you're, uh, you know, no one notices you and um, what I've heard with those, with those children is, and from their parents, is and choose something that you do not need to depend on others. So whether it's going into your own business or something like that, that too speaks to the environment that we have. So if we've got these groups who are not just by accident but actively working towards leaving New Brunswick or being disengaged, that's, that can't be great for the government. So that's what I'm trying to do is, is to say, you know, it's not about rewriting the curriculum because it's the right thing to do. It's about rewriting the curriculum and making it more inclusive because you're gonna have people want to feel like they're part of New Brunswick. 
Excellent. That, that, yeah. I don't know if that's going to make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't predict the future, but I'm hoping it will. No, well, it's a great insight. So you're right. There are people mm -hmm. in the province that know the way to survive here. And maybe we can talk a little bit about why it's like that. Sure. So yeah. if I can um, give you my two cents worth on systemic Certainly. racism. Yes. People spend a lot of time looking at the definition of systemic racism, and they try to define it as you know systems and barriers and mm -hmm. processes that, that lead to these outcomes and these results, which is probably true. But I see three fundamental issues that have not been addressed in the literature uh, or anywhere in practice, and until these are addressed, I don't know how we're going to change anything. So the three concepts that I see and we'll, I'll try to ta explain each one, are the concept of privilege, mm -hmm. the concept of bias, and the concept of aggression. So if we look at privilege, um, we could talk about white privilege if we want to, mm -hmm. we could talk about any type of privilege. So I know I grew up in Moncton in the 1970s, mm -hmm. and I went to high school in Moncton in the 1980s, and gay marriage was illegal at the time. I wasn't gay, mm -hmm. so I was born with the privilege of being a heterosexual, which meant I was allowed to love who I want to, yes. express my love for who I want to, uh, get married if I want to. Other people that weren't privileged the way I was didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about privilege as people that are, have silver spoons, but yes. on whatever issue we're looking at, privilege could be uh, relevant. Um, right now, our government officials, the big P politics people, are in litigation with some indigenous mm -hmm. communities. And those people had the privilege, our politicians had the privilege of inheriting stolen land. They don't realize their privilege, but until mm -hmm. they do, this debate with that community is not going to go anywhere. The second issue is bias. And there are different types of bias. There can be an unconscious bias, there can be an intentional yes. bias, and that type of thing. And with the bias, once again, if we have uh, a government that thinks it's legitimate and they say, we're going to defend ourselves in court against these communities, which they have to do, and our defense is going to be, we made a system that has paperwork in it. And we can show right back to an original treaty that we have documents, we have leases, we have deeds, but you're dealing with people who, that wasn't their system. The colonizer came and made that system the bias our politicians have right now is that their system is legitimate. Mm -hmm. And in logic, we have a saying that from a contradiction, anything follows. In law, they would say from one illegal act, every subsequent act would be illegal. So this is just an example of bias in the system. We can look at it in policing, we can look at it in healthcare, wherever. So the two things so far are um, um, bias and the next one is going to be aggression. And the ideas of aggressions are, they can be overt aggression or it can be a microaggression. So a microaggression could be, you know, when I'm in the store the other day, I took some chocolates off the shelf and I put them back and I went to pay for my yogurt and the person working said, where are the chocolates I saw you take? Well, am I going to have a debate about whether this is racist or not? Mm -hmm. It's clearly a microaggression towards mm -hmm. me. You're clearly watching me a little bit more than someone else. And all of these microaggressions line up. Uh, we heard an example the other day of a black guy that was in a nice car, and the police didn't do anything, they just follow him. Mm -hmm. This is, like I said, examples of microaggressions. So until we can get these things out of our systems, no matter what stories we hear, no matter who we consult with, no matter how many shared interests we have, these things are so insidious in our system, it's really difficult to think that we could address systemic racism. But if we could have a methodology for addressing those three things, I think we'd be able to uh, make some progress. So I'm wondering, and it's not a specific question, but any thoughts on these three conditions? Well, uh, the issue of privilege, I mean, it, is, it is a tricky one because oftentimes people will just get their back up, right, as soon as you bring up privilege. And, and I understand that. Right? We've all, we've all, most of us have worked hard to get where, wherever we get and we, we tend to focus on our own actions, not on what other people have had to, had to overcome. Um, I've actually started to use the word safety net rather than privilege. Uh, what I try to explain, to talk to people about what, what it actually means. So I said, you know, we, most of us have a safety net, but for some of us, those ropes in the safety net are really strong. And, and it's strong because of connections, it's strong because of background, it's strong because of all sorts of things. 
and others of us have safety nets that the ropes are actually quite weak and they could they could break at any time um, an example I give people because um, to take it away from race for you know just to sort of move you know you, I don't start, tend to start with something people don't understand I try to start with something they understand and then bring it you know to something they don't understand so um, when COVID hit um, every, I was working with the Atlantic Hand Opportunities Agency. The next day, we were all home working. Uh, computers were sent to our home, right? we were all set up, and we we're like, this is great. Like, this is a real privilege to be able to continue work. I wasn't worried about my paycheck. But I'm, the, you know, I'm having a meeting with a colleague of mine who makes the same amount of money I do, had all of her equipment delivered as well to her house, but she has a two-year-old sitting on her lap. Now you have a two-year-old, right? So you know it's not fun to be able to conduct a meeting, uh, to be able to do some work with this two-year-old who's so excited that you're now home, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They don't get COVID, they're like, oh, this is great, mommy and daddy are home. So she had, uh, from, from, like, uh, from my perspective, her safety net was as, as strong as mine, but then a rope of hers frayed because she did not have a way to, to work around this. Privilege would be that if our boss said, listen, I don't care, you just need to get your work done, right? But he didn't. What he said was to all of us, this needs to get done. You choose your hours, right? That's privilege. So that part of our safety net just became a little stronger. For a lot of people, they don't have that person coming out and saying, that's okay. So if we think about like Canadian experience, right? And you go to an employer and they say, well, you need Canadian experience. If you don't have that rope, then that part of your safety net is, there's a big hole. But if you do have someone who understands that and says, you know what? I see that your university came from another country. Who cares? Tell me about what you did um, in that and where you were before. Tell me about your experiences. So that's, to me, that's looking at privilege from a very different way, and that's how I would like us to start to look at it, is because I think the word privilege, like a lot of words, just has some negative connotations, and I understand like from a theoretical, academic, we use that word, but sometimes we have to change our language when we're talking to Joe Public, right? And uh, so that's, and I find that if I explain safety net rather than privilege, people understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, with bias, the same thing. Like people, I'll, I'll give examples of like that's an unconscious bias, and it's not you that has an unconscious bias or you. It's all of us, and here are mine, right? But that's not enough. Now it's like okay, you know your conscious bias. As as my teammate uh, Rob pointed out to me, he's like okay, you know your unconscious bias. It's now no longer unconscious. You consciously know that. Now what? Now what are you going to do mm -hmm. to address that? And that's what we need to be asking our, our government. Our government knows that there's biases. They know that there are biases in their system. Okay, now what are you gonna do? You know it exists. Are you gonna look the other way or are you gonna fix it? And the message that I feel very strongly about is there's no neutral ground anymore. You are either supporting a policy that is racist mm -hmm. or you're supporting a policy that is anti-racist or if you wanna broaden it discriminatory or anti-discriminatory. There is no safe middle ground anymore where you could say, well, you know, I'm not an anti-racist, but I'm not racist either. No, you have to choose. Mm -hmm. Because every policy, every rule, everything that we do supports the status quo or fights against the status quo. Before we wrap up, I was wondering if you had any closing thoughts. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, first I want to thank you both for inviting me to uh, to speak with you today and I will be reaching out to both of you to speak to you as well as the crux of my work is a consultation. Um, my closing thoughts are really just an invitation to anyone who would like to share with me their experiences or their thoughts about systemic racism. Um, the report, which is due at the end of September 2022, will not be my thoughts. Right? There'll be a collection of, of other people's experiences in New Brunswick. So I just, that's what I would like to do, is just put out that invitation to, uh, to please reach out to me. And how can folks get in touch with you? Uh, there's a few ways. First of all, um, probably the easiest way is to go to our website. Um, within the website, there are three ways to contribute. Uh, a formal submission, which is what most organizations have done. 
um, they can send an email saying they would like to speak to me and then that will be arranged and, and I will contact them directly. Or there is also an anonymous button where somebody can put in a submission but it is anonymous. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I should also say that any individual consultation is completely confidential. They will not be named in the report or no identifying factors. The other way uh, that people have been doing it, and I have to say I'm, I'm impressed by some people's skills, uh, their social media skills is through LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, someone actually called my mom to get my number. So, you know, whatever works for you, <laughs> just, just uh, give me a call. Splendid. And Dr. Christie, your closing remarks. Oh, like Matthew said, I, we can't thank you enough for being here. It was a wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. We ap appreciate how candid you were with this. Um, my th concluding thoughts are about being critical. Not necessarily skeptical, but yeah. critical. So I appreciate the importance of a consultation process, uh, but I think we're going to learn a lot of things that we already know. Uh, I'm concerned about the recommendation process. I don't for the life of me see how doing more of the same mm -hmm. is going to give us different results. And then finally, without analyzing these three aspects of our system, every policy and process we have, if it was examined for privilege, unconscious bias, and, micro and aggression, I think we could make a lot of work in making the system a lot safer for everybody. Mm -hmm. So once again, we want to thank you very much uh, for being with us today. And I think as you mentioned, it's easy to be skeptical of it but until we see everything on the table we can only hope that our government is sincere with with their actions with their words and they want to take these recommendations and move forward but again if, if history repeats itself it, it's you know really destined for failure but we hope this is you know that exception can i can i respond to that just for a second one thing i haven't said yet um which i think is much different this time is the political power of marginalized groups. And if that is the only reason that as potential voters, as potential political power, that the province is doing this, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, whatever it takes to make change. And so I think that is a big difference that we have not seen in the past. Absolutely. We'd like to thank you for being here with us. For our viewers at home, if you have any questions, comments or concerns or any topics you'd like us to speak about, feel free to give us an email at mbwa at chco.tv. We'll see you next time. My name is Matthew Martin from Black Lives Matter.